Hello and welcome to Earth Science, Lecture 24, Climate Change, Part 2. Earth's atmosphere, composed mostly of nitrogen and oxygen, make our lives possible. It provides our planet with just enough warmth and pressure to enable water to cycle among the three phases, solid, liquid, and gaseous. It protects us from harmful solar radiation, and it produces the weather patterns that variously bring us days of sunshine, clouds, and rain or snow. In this portion of the presentation, we'll discuss how and why our atmosphere is the way it is today. When Earth first formed by accretion of planetesimals, that is, rocks slamming into each other and making a bigger rock, gases were probably trapped within the Earth's interior, in the same proportions that they were present in the solar nebula, that is, the gaseous region in which our solar system formed from. But since the early Earth was hot enough to be molten throughout its volume, most of these trapped gases were released. Earth's gravity was too weak to prevent hydrogen and helium from escaping to space. The atmosphere that remained still contained substantial amounts of hydrogen, but in the form of relatively massive molecules of water vapor, H2O. In addition to releasing water, intense volcanic activity known as outgassing of this early period would have released carbon dioxide and ammonia. Recall that carbon dioxide uh, dissolved in rainwater in the oceans, where it can combine with substances to form a class of minerals called carbonates, limestone and marble being examples of carbonate-bearing rocks. These uh, form sediments on the ocean floor, which are eventually recycled via the process of subduction. And so we have a cycle going on that we have seen throughout Earth's history. At the same time the levels of water and carbon dioxide were decreasing, ultraviolet light broke ammonia apart, that was NH3, to create two new gases in the atmosphere, hydrogen, H2, and nitrogen, N2. The hydrogen, being too light, escaped into space. Through the loss or relocation of water vapor, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen, the remaining nitrogen became the dominant component of the atmosphere. Today, nitrogen still forms the bulk of our atmosphere, that is about 78%. But it is the other main components that matter the most, that mostly oxygen. The appearance of life on Earth set into motion a radical transformation of the atmosphere. Early single-cell organisms converted energy from sunlight into chemical energy using the process of photosynthesis, a chemical process that consumes carbon dioxide and water and releases oxygen. Oxygen molecules are very reactive, so originally most of the oxygen produced by photosynthesis combined with other substances to form minerals called oxides. Eventually, so much oxygen was being produced that it could not all be absorbed to form oxides, and O2, that is oxygen, began to accumulate in the atmosphere. Ultraviolet light transform some of the oxygen into molecules of O3, or ozone. The absorption of this energy heats up the upper parts of the atmosphere, creating the stratosphere and giving us a protective layer uh, from UV radiation known as the ozone layer. About 2 billion years ago, a new type of life evolved to take advantage of this newly abundant oxygen. These new organisms produced energy by consuming oxygen and releasing carbon dioxide, a, pro a process known as respiration that is used by all modern animals, including humans. The abundance of atmospheric oxygen is due almost exclusively to the presence of life, a situation that has no parallel anywhere else in the solar system. So here you can just kind of see that eventually O2 starts to accumulate in the atmosphere and it skyrockets when life comes about. And then eventually it starts to settle in when there's a balance. And so here we see the current composition of the atmosphere. Uh, primarily nitrogen left over from outgassing makes up the majority of our atmosphere, so 78%. But oxygen is 21%. And then everything else, with argon and carbon dioxide, making up the other remaining, uh, let's say, percent. 
So this brings us now to a very important part of the discussion. We've looked at the science behind it, how uh, the greenhouse effect works, and we've seen very briefly the history of our atmosphere. So we know that it's changing, and now let's take a look at what happens now that we're here. One of the extraordinary characteristics of Earth is that it is covered with life. From the floors of the oceans to the tops of mountains, and from the frigid polar caps to the blistering deserts. So far we have hinted at how our planet and living organisms interact. The greenhouse effect has given Earth a suitable temperature for the evolution of life, and over billions of years that evolution has transformed the chemical composition of the atmosphere. We humans are well adapted to the present day conditions on our planet. The amount of oxygen in our atmosphere, the average temperature of our planet, and the ultraviolet absorbing ozone layer are just what we need to survive. We have seen that these ideal conditions are no accident. They are consequences of our planet's unique geology and biology. Nevertheless, the stories of dramatic and permanent climate changes that have occurred on Mars and Venus should teach us to take nothing for granted. Our planet may regulate its own climate quite effectively over long timescales, but fossil and geological evidence tells us that rapid and substantial changes in global climate can occur on shorter ones. So let's explore in greater depth how Earth and the organisms that live on it, especially humans, affect both the planet and one another. So first of all, we're going to look at something off-topic, but important. So let's discuss the ozone hole. Chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, which have been used in refrigeration and electronics, and methyl bromide, which is used in fumigation, are destroying the ozone in the stratosphere. Ozone absorbs ultraviolet radiation from the sun. Without this high-altitude ozone layer, ultraviolet radiation from the sun would beat down on Earth's surface with greatly intense or increased intensity. Such radiation breaks apart most of the delicate molecules that form living tissue. A complete loss of the ozone layer would lead to a catastrophic ecological disaster. So this image here is just showing that without this ozone layer, ultraviolet rays can get in, and it's because CFCs were destroying them. But, the disturbing discovery set the stage for an environmental triumph the Montreal Protocol of 1987. This pact to phase out the use of CFCs and restore the ozone layer was eventually signed by every country, uh, every county, uh, what am I saying, excuse me, every country in the United Nations, the first UN treaty to achieve universal ratification. The unparalleled co cooperation has had a major impact. Quote, if we had just kept letting CFCs increase at a pretty normal rate, characteristics of the 1970s, uh, the decreased ozone levels of the whole uh, would have eventually covered the entire planet, said atmospheric physicist Paul Newman of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Global ozone dropped a little bit after CFCs were banned, but the good news is that we had, if, if we had done nothing, it would have gotten really, really bad. Now, a complete rebound seems imminent. Some scientists project that by 2080, global ozone will return to its 1950 levels. So, what's the point of me throwing in these two slides? Well, we can clearly affect our atmosphere, both for the worse and the better. The Montreal Protocol proved that the world could come together and take action even on things such as climate change. So, we can come together and we know we do affect our atmosphere. We have direct evidence of this. So let's shift to our discussion of global warming. All life on Earth subsists in a relatively thin layer known as the biosphere, which includes the land, oceans, the crust a kilometer beneath our feet, and even up to the stratosphere 30,000 kilometers or 30,000 meters overhead where microbes have been found. The biosphere which has taken billions of years to evolve to its present state, is a delicate and highly complex system in which plants and animals depend on one another for their mutual survival. The average productivity of the biosphere changes little from year to year, but there are small variations. Plants require four things to grow. Nutrients, light, water, and moderate temperatures. When any one of these things change, plants grow 
uh, plant growth will change as well. Ocean productivity, as illustrated um, by the distribution of chlorophyll, depends on ocean temperatures and the availability of nutrients, usually brought to the surface by ocean currents and mixing. Ocean chlorophyll concentrations can change when ocean currents shift or the temperatures change. So in short, the state of the biosphere depends crucially on the temperatures of both the ocean and the atmosphere. Even small changes can have dramatic consequences. An example of this sensitivity that recurs every three to seven years is the El Nino phenomenon, in which temperatures at the surface of the equatorial Pacific Ocean rise by about two to three degrees. Ordinarily, water from the cold depths of the ocean is able to well upward, bringing with it nutrients that are used by microscopic marine organisms, called phytoplankton, that live near the surface. But during El Nino, the warm surface water suppresses this upwelling, and the phytoplankton can starve. This wrecks havoc on organisms such as mollusks that feed on the phytoplankton, on the fish that feed on the mollusks, and on the birds and mammals that eat those fish. During the 1982 to 1983 El Nino, one quarter of adult sea lions off the Peruvian coast starved with all, all their pups because of this effect. So the point is, not only can we have an effect on everything, but it's very sensitive is what we're getting at. So our species, unfortunately, is having an increasing effect on the biosphere because our population is skyrocketing. A sharp rise in population began in the late 1700s with the Industrial Revolution and the spread of modern ideas about hygiene. This rise accelerated in the 20th century thanks to medical and technological advancements ranging from antibiotics to high-yield grains. In 1960, there were 3 billion people on Earth. In 1975, 4 billion. In 1999, 6 billion. Projections by the United Nations Population Division show that there will be more than 8 billion people on Earth by the year 2030 and more than 9 billion by 2050. Every human being has basic requirements, that being food, clothing, and housing, and we all need fuel for cooking and heating. To meet the demands, we burn fossil fuels, cut down forests, and build sprawling cities. So, the more we have an increase in population, the more we demand from our planet. A striking example of this activity is occurring in the Amazon rainforest of Brazil. Tropical rainforests are vital to our planet's ecology because they absorb significant amounts of carbon dioxide and release oxygen via photosynthesis. Although rainforests occupy only 7% of the world's land areas, they are home to at least 50% of all plant and animal species on Earth. Nevertheless, to make way for farms and grazing land, people simply cut down these trees and set them on fire in a process known as slash and burn. Slash and burn agriculture has been widely practiced in human history. It is still extensively used in tropical forests, where some 250 to 500 million people are thought to practice it. The rainforests that once thrived in Central America, India, and western coasts of Africa are almost gone. The world's forests continue to shrink as population increases and forest land is converted to agriculture and other uses. For example, some 129 million hetta acres of forest, an area almost equivalent to the size of South Africa, have been lost since just 1990. According to the United Nations estimates, nearly 10.2 million hetta acres, or 25.1 million acres, of tropical forest were permanently destroyed each year during the 1990s. Between the years 2000 and 2005, the average figure increased to 10.4 million hetta acres, or 25.7 million acres, per year. But over the past 25 years, the rate of net global deforestation has slowed down by more than 50%, due heavily in part to increased regulations um, and areas coming into protection. Some of the excess CO2 that is released is taken up by plants or dissolved in the ocean. It is estimated that about 45% does remain in the atmosphere, however. So, the point is, this is what we're seeing. I mean, 
here is what we call the global carbon dioxide budget. Uh, and so this kind of shows you what is being released into the atmosphere and what is being taken in. We learned uh, just recently that the ocean does absorb some carbon dioxide and lock it away. And we know that trees absorb some as well via photosynthesis. But by us changing the land, uh, by the growth of our atmosphere, and by our fossil fuel and cement release, we are releasing far more uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than is being taken in. And as a result, it's the amount that's in our atmosphere is increasing. And if you remember from our discussion of greenhouse effect, this means that we're adding blankets and getting warmer. So this shows you, let's see, 8.9 um, plus 0.9, and then minus the 2.9 and 2.6 gives us an overall growth of 4.3 gigatons of carbon dioxide every single year with our atmosphere. So this is an issue. The United States Energy Information Administration's latest international energy outlook uh, in 2017 projects that world energy consumption will grow by 28% between 2015 and 2040. Through 2040, uh, they also project that it, uh, increased world consumption of marketed energy from all fuel sources, except for coal, um, will increase. Coal will stay about the same. Renewables are expected to be the fastest growing energy source with consumption increasing by an average of 2.3% every year between now and 2040. So the point is, population increases, and so does our energy demands. So again, we are seeing increases in our petroleum and other liquids, natural gases, and coal staying about the same, but still we have to keep using it. And so this is a problem because this releases some of that CO2 into our atmosphere. And here's the big problem. Uh, this graph just kind of breaks everything down. It looks really intimidating at first. Uh, but here is our different types of energy um, that we have. So we have solar, nuclear, and so on. And this is showing which, uh, basically how much uh, carbon emissions are coming from what types of sources. So petroleum and natural gas l leave us with lots of carbon emissions, and so does coal. And these are our three main energy sources. I mean, if you look at this graphic, these are our top three. Renewables are coming up quickly where they have no uh, carbon emissions, but still, we have tons and tons, quite literally, of carbon emissions being emitted, and this is a big problem. So our goal should be to reduce our natural gas, coal, and petroleum uh, abundance or uh, needs. So we now know that we're adding CO2 to the atmosphere. I mean, that's that's exactly what's happening. And so let's take a look at some graphs of how this is appearing to us. So the most troubling influence of human affairs on the biosphere is a consequence of burning fossil fuels, that is, natural gas, petroleum, and coal. That is, we're burning them in automobiles, in our airplanes, our power plants, uh, as well as even when we burn forests and brushlands for agriculture and cooking. So this burning releases carbon dioxide into Earth's atmosphere, and we are now adding CO2 to the atmosphere faster than plants and geological processes can extract it, as we saw previously in the carbon dioxide budget. So the figure here shows how carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere has increased since 1958, when scientists began to measure this quantity on an ongoing basis. This sawtooth-like pattern results from plants absorbing more carbon dioxide during the spring and summer, uh, and not as much in the winter, when plant life is less abundant. The CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere have increased more than 20% since continuous observation started in 1958. So, what I would like you to do, and this is, I think, one of the coolest videos if you actually sit and watch this, is please pause the video and watch the video that I've linked here or in the YouTube description. It shows a really, really great uh, simulation of carbon dioxide levels in our atmosphere throughout a year. And you can actually see how plant life has an effect on it. Uh, so I would play it within this lecture, but I don't want to have to deal with any copyright issues. So please take a look at that before moving forward. I think you'll learn a lot from it. So, uh, let's continue. So, we were just looking at CO2 concentrations for the last eh, 60 or so years. Well, to put the values shown in the previous figure into perspective, however, 
we need to know the atmospheric concentrations in earlier eras, not just in the last 50 to 60 years. Well, scientists have learned this by analyzing air bubbles trapped at various depths in the ice that blanketed the Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets. Each winter, a new layer of ice is deposited, and so the depth of a bubble indicates the year in which it was trapped. This figure here uses data obtained in this way to show how the atmospheric CO2 concentrations have varied since 1000, the year 1000. While there has been some natural variation in the concentration, its value has skyrocketed since the beginning of our Industrial Revolution around 1800. If there are no changes in our energy consumption uh, habits by 2050, the atmospheric concentrations are expected to reach 600 parts per million, which is well off of this graph. Well, so that only takes us back a thousand years, so big deal, right? I mean, there's still a lot of history of the Earth. Well, we can actually go back several hundred thousand years. Data from older and deeper bubbles of trapped ice show that in the last 650,000 years before the Industrial Revolution, the CO2 concentrations were never greater than 300 parts per million. The present-day CO2 concentration is greater than this by over 25% and has grown to its present elevated level in just over half a century. So, I'm gonna, you're probably going to hear me say this a lot in the next few uh, moments, but it's not so much the fact that we're warming that matters, it's the rate at which it's happening that is alarming. You can see that there are natural variations in CO2 concentrations and temperature, but it's the re recent activity in the... In, immediate almost nature of it that is so alarming. So let's go back as far as we can with our data. Back 800,000 years, here is that same graph. So again, we never go over 300 parts per million, but in recent history, we're actually, as of today or something, I think we're around 412 parts per million. So we're even quite a bit higher than this. So here is a graphic uh, showing how all of this works. So this is just a quick video. Uh, I think it's one minute long. I'll be quiet during this video, even though there's no sound. Or maybe I'll read along, if, it, if, I, if I can read fast enough. In 1958, Charles David Keeling of Scripps Institution of Oceanography began measuring concentrations of CO2 at Hawaii's Mauna Loa Ob Observatory. This is the foundation of modern climate change research. I won't have time to read this, so you can pause it if you need to. But notice we see that zigzagging pattern because of plant life changing throughout the years. So we're already over 410 parts per million, which is significantly higher than it's ever been before. And notice that this stark increase started around the Industrial Revolution. And here's the graph again for the last 800,000 years using ice core data. This is where we're at today, slightly more than 410. Okay, so hopefully that gives you at least a little bit of perspective. Um, now, again, a lot of, oh gosh, I hate all these. Uh, so a lot of people will often say, well, the climate always changes. How do we know it's a human effect? Again, it's, first of all, just looking at uh, this graphic, you can see the rate at which it's happening is what's alarming. But how do we know for sure that it's human activity? Well, we actually do kind of have a way to know. And let's see if I can change slides here, please. Uh, here we go. The fact that the recent increases in CO2 concentrations is due virtually entirely to human activities is well established, but it is quite reasonable to ask how we know this. One way that we know that human activity is responsible for the increased CO2 is simply by looking at historical records of human activities. Since the Industrial Revolution, we have been burning fossil fuels and clearing and burning forest lands at an unprecedented rate, and these processes convert organic carbon into carbon dioxide. Careful accounting of the amount of fossil fuels that has been extracted and combusted, and how much land clearing has occurred, shows that we have produced far more carbon dioxide than now remains in the atmosphere. The roughly 500 billion metric tons of carbon that we have uh, produced is enough to raise the atmosphere concentrations of CO2 to nearly 500 parts per million. The concentrations have not reached that level because the ocean and the terrestrial biosphere 
have the capacity to absorb some of it. So we could be at 500, but because uh, of our water sinks and the fact that you know plant life absorbs some of the CO2, we're not quite there yet. However, it is the fact that we produce CO2 faster than the oceans and biosphere can absorb it that explains the observed increase. Another quite independent way that we know that fossil fuel burning and land clearing specifically are responsible for the increase in CO2, in the last 150 years at least, is thought uh, is through the measurement of carbon isotopes. Isotopes are simply different atoms with the same chemical behavior or makeup as those with the same uh, or those with different masses. Carbon dioxide produced from burning fossil fuels or burning forests has quite a different isoto- isotopic composition than CO2 in our atmosphere. Although it may seem that a carbon atom is just the same as every other carbon atom out there, that is not the case. In fact, there are three isotopes of carbon, or three forms of carbon. All three react the same way in chemical reactions. The only difference between them is that they have slightly different masses. About 99% of all carbon on Earth is carbon-12. About 1% is carbon-13, and a trace amount is carbon-14. So where are we going with this? I mean, why am I bringing all this chemistry into it? Well, something called the Seuss effect is important. The Seuss effect is a change in the concentrations of the heavy isotopes of carbon, that is carbon-13 and 14, by the admixture of large amounts of fossil fuels derived, uh, by, of fossil fuel derived carbon dioxide, which is depleted in carbon-13 and contains no carbon-14. So, we'll step through how this works. There's no reason for me to hide all that. So, plants take up carbon-14 by fixing atmospheric carbon through photosynthesis. Animals then take carbon-14 into their bodies when they consume those plants. Thus, living plants and animals have the same ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 as the atmospheric carbon dioxide. Once organisms die, they stop exchanging carbon with the atmosphere, and thus they no longer take up any new carbon-14. Radioactive decay then gradually depletes the carbon-14 in these organisms. This effect is the basic idea behind radiocarbon dating. So photosynthetically, fixed carbon in terrestrial plants is depleted in carbon-13 compared to the atmospheric carbon dioxide. This depletion is great uh, in plants which form the bulk of terrestrial biomass worldwide. So fossil fuels, such as coal and oil, are made primarily of plant materials that were deposited millions of years ago. The period of time equates to thousands of half-lives of carbon-14. So essentially all of the carbon-14 in fossil fuels is gone. It's decayed and left. So fossil fuels are depleted in carbon-13 relative to the atmosphere because they were originally formed from living organisms. Therefore, the carbon that comes from fossil fuels that is returned into the atmosphere uh, through combustion is depleted in both 13 and 14 carbon compared to the carbon dioxide that's already there. So we know a difference between them. So if the atmosphere is increasing in the amount Uh, excuse me, if the atmosphere is losing carbon-13 and 14, we know where it's going. So with what we've covered thus far, we have reached our second important takeaway in the end of our second part of the lecture. The burning of fossil fuels and other human activities are clearly increasing the amounts of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Observations show that currently the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide is significantly higher, about 30%, than it has been at any time during the past million years, and it is rising rapidly. We can be confident that the rise is a result of human activity because the amount or because the atmosphere is becoming enriched in molecules of CO2 carrying the distinct ratio of isotopes present only in fossil fuels. So, we now know how the greenhouse effect works and we now know that we're contributing to the greenhouse effect. So now we're going to look at temperatures and what effect we're actually having and what potential consequences we might have in the third part of this lecture. As always, thanks for watching and have a great day.